much for attending today's enrichment program. My name is Erin Payton, and I'm the Executive Director of the 19th Century Charitable Association, which is located in Oak Park, Illinois. Our mission is strengthening our community through learning, giving, and the sharing of our landmark building. Before I start today's program, I just want to give you a couple of bits of information. Throughout the program, something might strike your fancy or start a question in your brain. And if that happens, you can ask your question or leave your comment in our Q&A or our chat section. And at the end of the program, if we have time, we will actually unmute you and let you ask the question directly to our author. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy today's program. I'm going to welcome to the program, Deb Hammond, who is the chair of our literature committee. Hi. I'm Deb Watson Hammond from the 19th Century Literature uh, Committee, and I'm very happy to present our second program. We try to have a variety of literature programs, a variety of genres, and uh, we're lucky living in the Chicago metro area that we can get some great authors to speak to us. Kathleen Rooney is our speaker today, and she's a founding editor of Rose Metal Press, a nonprofit publisher of literary work in hybrid genres, as well as the founding member of Poems While You Wait, a team of poets and their typewriters who compose commissioned poetry on demand. She teaches in the English department at DePaul University. Uh, she, is a, she has received numerous awards and citations over time. And I'm just going to mention a few of them. She's a winner of the Ruth Lilly Fellowship from Poetry Magazine. And she's the author of nine books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Uh, her most recent books include the national bestseller, Lillian Box Fix, Box Fish Takes a Walk, uh, and The Listening Room, a novel of Georgette and Lulu Magritte, and her new novel, which we're going to be talking about today, Shara Me and Major Whittlesley, based on the true story of the Great War which was published just this year, 2020. Uh, if you're interested in the book, autographed copies of it are available on uh, Lake Street at the book table. Uh, so be sure to uh, go see Jason and, and get a copy if you're interested. So Kathleen Rooney. Much Deb and thank you Erin um, for those introductions and um, thank you very much for uh, everyone who's attending. I um, can't see you but I can see the numbers and, and I know you're there. So um, I am a professor at DePaul and I always like to give a small roadmap of how the um, program is going to be going. And so what I was gonna start by uh, doing is just saying a little bit of an overview about the book and then reading um, about a page's worth uh, from the novel. And then I have a slideshow. So I'll start sharing my screen and kind of going through the real life inspirations. And then uh, I will definitely leave time for questions at the end. So I look forward to uh, anything that you might want to know about. So. My novel is called Share on Me and Major Whittlesey and I, think that you know kind of the elevator pitch for what it's about is right there in the title it is about these two people i'm going to go ahead and say people even though one is as you can see a pigeon uh because i think that's one of the things i explore is the idea of personhood uh for animals and and the personhood of of entities who are not human and so this is based on a true story so um in world war one there was this incident that this novel kind of builds up to. And um, Sherami was this messenger pigeon who ended up carrying a message that saved a group of soldiers who were led by the second person in this sort of elevator pitch title, uh, Major Charles Whittlesey. And I, you know, I'll get into all the details of, you know, who Sherami was, who he was, sort of how they ended up in this situation. Um, but I think what you need to know about the novel and how it works is that it alternates point of view. So it's first person point of view, but first you hear from Sherami, so it's first person pigeon. And then you hear from Major Whittlesey, so it's the more, I think, expected first person human that many novels are told in. And then you go back and forth across the book. So you hear from her, you hear from him, her, him, until you get 
to the end. And even though it is absolutely a war story, a story of World War I, it's also, I hope, a portrait of both of these people. And so you get to kind of hear their childhoods, what led them to become involved in the war in the first place, uh, the war itself. And then also a significant portion of the book is kind of about how they have to struggle with limited success to kind of recuperate their lives after the war. So that's sort of the, the overview. And so, like I said, we hear in this kind of ABAB pattern. So I'm gonna start with chapter one, uh, where you're hearing first from Cher on me. So I'm just gonna read a couple paragraphs at the very beginning. Monuments matter most to pigeons and soldiers. I myself have become a monument, a feathered statue inside a glass case. In life, I was both a pigeon and a soldier. In death, I am a piece of mediocre taxidermy collecting dust in the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. The museum has closed and everyone has gone home. The last guests took their leave at 5.30 as they do every weekday. And even the janitorial staffers have finished their tasks. Miles of floors polished and pine scented, acres of displays gleaming and silent. A few hours remain before midnight. This is the eve of the 100 year anniversary of what, according to the United States Army, was the most important day of my avian life, October 4th, 1918. I'm not sure I agree. That day was an important one, certainly, but days don't carry the same meaning for pigeons as they do for humans, and my life comprised other days, days that might be equally worth note, if not to the Army, then at least to me and to those I loved. Pigeons can love. Pigeons cannot fight. Yet I was once as well known to the school children and grown up citizens alike as any human hero of what was then called the Great War. Hence the stuffing of my mangled body. Hence my enshrinement here in the grandmother's attic of the entire country. And so um, that's something I'll talk about. She really is in the Smithsonian. You can go visit her there, you know, when it's safe to go visit places, uh, you can pay her a little homage where she's in the freedom, um, the Price of Freedom exhibit uh, right before the World War II exhibit and right after um, Julia Child's Kitchen. So for those of you who are museum goers. And then now this is just the very beginning of chapter two, which is where we start hearing from Charles Whittlesey. So this is the human protagonist chiming in. Monuments matter most to pigeons and soldiers. Some matter more than others. None matter more to me than the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on Riverside Drive on the Upper West Side. It's not a monument for my war, the Great War, the war that has caused me to be known these past three years as Go to Hell Whittlesey, heroic commander of the Lost Battalion. Instead, it's white marble gleams for the Union Army, which won the Civil War almost 60 years ago. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument has a personal significance for me, one that has nothing to do with war. It's where I, fresh from Harvard Law School, naive and lonesome, met the man who would be my entree into the double life I led until I chose to let the war interrupt it. So that's how uh, the first two chapters start. Um, and so I'll leave that there for now. And I'm gonna start um, sharing my screen and I'll go through sort of some of the uh, inspiration as to how I wrote this because a lot of times novelists get asked, what made you write this? And I love that question. So I will go ahead and kind of answer that now. So this is, you know, my talk about the book above the trenches and in them. And that kind of refers to how, because I chose to use a pigeon point of view, we get sort of, um, you know, if you'll forgive the pun, a bird's eye view of a war that was known for very much being, um, with few exceptions, very much on the ground and in the mud and in the earth. And so you can see on the left, there's Cher Ami, who is um, on the pedestal that they put her on when they put her in the Smithsonian. And you can see she's missing a leg and you know she looks somewhat the worse for wear and I'll talk a little bit about her injuries. Um, and then on the right you see 
in his dress uniform, uh, Charles Whittlesey, who was this commander of the Lost Battalion, which wasn't originally known as the Lost Battalion, but became known as that for reasons. So um, we're going to hear about both of them. So I think, you know, something that I like to, to say when I give these talks, um, not just about this book, but sort of about any books is that I think for a lot of writers and certainly for me, uh, creativity or inspiration is kind of this combination. It's sort of like a two factor sort of uh, chemical interaction where you've got sort of the material that's already inside you just as a person and the stuff that interests you or fascinates you. And then something maybe from outside comes in and catalyzes that uh, pre-existing material. And so it's sort of like the spark that touches the like tinder and sets the story aflame, if you will. And so, as it says here, I've always been really fascinated with World War I, I think because it was just such a huge disaster and the scope of it boggled my mind as soon as I first learned about it. And, you know, statistics can be dry, but I like to share them anyway, just because I think it's important to give the scale of what happened. And so, the combination of military and civilian casualties, as you can see, was over 40 million. And 20 million of those were deaths and 20 million were injuries. And then within those 20 million deaths, it was about 9.7 million military personnel and about 10 million civilians. So it's a war that was just horrible for everyone, um, just massive global suffering. And something about trench warfare haunted me. And, you know, I say here, it's um, the absurd futility. And I just remember learning about the trenches. And so just this very idea that millions of men from almost every country agreed to fight in this incredibly brutal way where they would dig into the earth, live in the mud, live in the water, they'd be cold, wet, their feet would never be dry. They would be getting trench foot. They might be getting gangrene. If they had injuries, they wouldn't be well treated. They had body lice. The food was terrible. And they would just sit in the trenches until the order to attack came when someone would blow a whistle and they would go over the top. Um, all these expressions from the Great War that are still in our language today. And that would consist of them climbing out of the trenches and running across the field facing probably barbed wire, probably landmines, maybe tanks, almost certainly machine guns. And I just, I couldn't understand why people would agree to do that. And, you know, you might be thinking like, why would a little kid be into World War I? And part of the reason is that my own dad was in the military and he sometimes taught military history classes and he would have his books around the house. And so for whatever reason, I, you know, started reading up on World War I and became kind of, um, you know, just obsessed with it in that sort of like armchair historian kind of way. And other things, you know, began to feed into that. Like on the left here, I don't know if anybody remembers this show, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. It was very short lived, I think probably because it was so expensive to produce um, where, you know, the titular Indiana Jones joined up um, and it was, you know, he joined the Belgian army because the United States weren't involved yet. And I thought that depiction of the war was really fascinating because it was very anti-romantic. It didn't make war look fun. It made it look just as bad as it must have been. And then I also, as I got a little bit older, started getting into the literature of World War I of which, you know, many people probably know there's a lot. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I think I'm interested in World War I is because you know, unlike some wars before and some wars after, it was a war that was um, super idealistic and it was fought both in America um, and in England by men of many different classes. You had plenty of working class people, people who'd never had like a proper formal education, but also lots of guys who went to Oxford, went to Cambridge, went to Harvard. Charles Whittlesey was um, a graduate of Williams College and then also Harvard Law. He was a Wall Street lawyer. So unlike in you know, many conflicts, there's this really rich written record of what it was like to fight. 
So for someone like me, there was a lot to learn. And um, it's not a poetry reading, but I love poetry. So I'm going to just share uh, quickly my favorite World War I poem. And it's by Edward Thomas. And I think there's this extra poignancy when you're reading the literature of World War I, because you can always check and see, you know, did this poet make it or did they not? And Edward Thomas, as you can see, did not make it. He died in 1917 and he was killed in battle. So I just, I love this poem. Rain, midnight rain, nothing but the wild rain on this bleak hut and solitude and me remembering again that I shall die and neither hear the rain nor give it thanks for washing me cleaner than I have been since I was born into this solitude. Blessed are the dead that the rain rains upon, but here I pray that none whom once I loved is dying tonight or lying still awake, solitary, listening to the rain, either in pain or thus in sympathy, helpless among the living and the dead, like cold water among broken reeds, myriads of broken reeds, all still and stiff, like me, who have no love, which this wild rain has not dissolved, except the love of death, if love it be towards what is perfect and cannot, the tempest tells me, disappoint. And then all that is, um, you know, kind of some of the background, but then a little bit more of a personal connection as to why I was interested in World War I is that, again, my dad was um, in the military and so he was and still is um, an American Legion member and his post is post 80 in Downers Grove, so not too far from Oak Park. And uh, it's named after a World War I casualty. It's named after uh, Alexander Bradley Burns, who you can see on the right there in the photograph. And he actually went to my high school, Downers Grove North, and enlisted not long after he graduated his senior year. And the Post website um, and the little plaque in the hall explains that he was the first of our boys from Downers Grove to make the supreme sacrifice and he was killed by shrapnel. And so I just, you know, when I was in high school and even still, I think that's one of the things that makes any war so sad is, is that it's bad for everyone, but it's especially bad for the youth and especially for young men. And you just have all these millions of, of people whose whole lives should have been ahead of them taken from them. And I think especially in World War I, where it's not a very well understood or very well remembered war, it's hard not to feel a little bit um, tragic or a little bit pointless about the fact that someone like this died so young. And then another lifelong fascination of mine is pigeons. And, you know, of course, this is the famous uh, Mary Poppins scene. Um, but I, I grew up in small towns in the suburbs and always loved going to cities. And anytime I was in a city, I would notice that pigeons were there, right? Pigeons are ubiquitous in cities. And I know not everyone likes them. I know there's a whole thing about how they're rats with wings, but I strenuously object to that characterization. I think it's unfair to pigeons and unfair to rats, um, but I think pigeons are actually remarkable birds. And I'll say a bit more about that as we go. Um, but to me, they were always a sign of, you know, cosmopolitanism and urbanity and being in a place that I knew I loved. And so this is, you know, from the Feed the Birds song where Mary takes the Banks children, uh, you know, into urban London and has them, you know, meet this bird lady outside of St. Paul's who makes her living selling bags of bird seed for tuppence a bag. And it's, I mean, if you're Mary Poppins movie fans, it's, I don't know, it's hard to watch this scene without crying for me. So this is me with some of my friends, um, my pigeon friends down in Daly Plaza. My sister uh, is a photographer and took this one. And um, you can just see there's like such a beautiful array of colors and sizes in the pigeons. Um, and then, you know, so those are the two sort of internal bits of uh, kindling that were already in me. And then the final spark that kind of set me off on writing this book was that I teach at DePaul University and I have this class that's kind of based on my novel, um, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. It's not, you know, I don't teach my own novel, but it's based on that idea of being a walker in a city and it's called Drift and Dream, 
writers, Urban Walker, and so we looked at a lot of people like Virginia Woolf um, and Baudelaire who wrote about walking in the city. And back in 2013, I had this student, Brian Michich, who I always give credit to uh, when I talk about this book. And he turned in a poem that had this kind of throwaway line about an old guy sitting on a park bench surrounded by pigeons. And he had this little aside that said, but this was no share on me story, look it up. And it was funny because I always tell my students, look it up, because uh, I think that's one of the great things about reading and about literature is that if you happen upon something that you don't know about, you can just look it up and then suddenly you move from ignorance to knowledge. And so I looked it up. And, you know, so that was kind of the inspiration part of the slideshow. And now here is um, sort of the, the real life figures behind it. I was amazed to learn about the Lost Battalion, which was this group of 554 soldiers that was led by Whittlesey. And, you know, you can see him here to the right. And so he looks obviously, you know, like the same guy in the opening slide, but you can see he's more in his um, battle attire where he's wearing the hard metal helmet and he has all his supplies and, and things on him um, because he was out in the field. And so this group of soldiers, like I said, was not originally called the Lost Battalion. Um, they were just the 77th and they were from New York City. And it was this really, really beloved group of soldiers because they were kind of New York's own. And so they had, before they left to go over there to Europe, um, they've been paraded through the streets of Manhattan and held up as, you know, these Americans who were going to win the war and stop this like four years of slaughter that Europe had been going through just bleeding itself white. And the kind of remarkable thing about them is to go back to that class point, um, most of the officers were people like Whittlesey who were highly educated, highly professional, very white collar. Um, like I said, he was a Wall Street lawyer who literally worked down on Wall Street. Um, doing financial contracts and things like that. And then most of the privates and sort of um, lower ranking men were working class, they were immigrants, they were from all over the world. A lot of them hadn't even spoken English until they started entering basic training. And so they were held up as this testament to kind of like the American melting pot and what America could do if it put its mind to it. And so people, <coughs> people loved them and people were paying attention to what they were doing. Also, um, as is still the case to a lesser extent, but a still big extent, the media was very much centered in New York. And so of course, if you've got New York's own, um, the New York newspapers are gonna be covering them aggressively. So everybody was paying attention. And then in October of 1918, um, they became involved in this incident that was later known as the pocket where everyone all along the line, millions of guys were supposed to, on the Allied side, advance. And the idea was that if all of them pushed forward together, they would break the German line, they would crush the enemy, they would end the war. And you won't be surprised to know that as often occurs in war, it did not go to plan. And so Whittlesey's group of men were the only ones all along the line who broke through. And that made them victims of their own success. And they had been told because of this master plan that they were gonna advance with almost no equipment, right? The idea was they're just gonna push through, don't bring your raincoat, don't bring extra food, don't bring first aid kits, because once you break it, we'll send all these supplies. But that didn't happen. And so as it says here, that meant that they had to hold out for days surrounded by the Germans, totally isolated from the other allied forces with no food or water. And that was awful, but it got worse when there was a friendly fire incident. And so, you know, obviously friendly fire incidents are never intentional and the Americans thought that they were shelling the Germans and the idea was that they were trying to provide cover for Witt and his men to get away. Um, or at least not to be killed by the Germans. And, you know, I think just to pause here, it's important to note how, like how beloved Whit was by his men because they're going through this ordeal with no end in sight. There was no way for them to know if they were gonna be found, what was going on beyond their own immediate vicinity. 
Um, but Witt knew that if they surrendered, for one thing, the Germans in all probability might just kill them. Um, so there was no guarantee of safety if they surrendered. And two, that if they surrendered, morale would be crushed um, because there had been this idea in the spring of 1918, you know, that we're gonna be done. Like the Americans are gonna rush in and end this war. And obviously months had passed and that hadn't happened. And so Witt knew that if he gave up, um, it might only be a small group of men, but it would be psychically very crushing. And so this is kind of where pigeons start to come in. And you can see um, this is kind of a general picture. This is not the lost battalion, but this is just an example of what it would look like um, when someone was putting a pigeon into the air to carry a message. But in World War I, they did have telephones, but that technology was extremely analog, very clunky huge wires and cables. Both sides were always trying to cut those cables, which often happened. In fact, Alexander Bradley Burns, who I talked about, the Downers Grove guy, um, was killed when he was repairing telephone wires. That's what he was out doing when he got killed. And so that wasn't very reliable. It was very dangerous. They had radio, but it was only one way. There was no two-way radio yet. They wouldn't finish developing that until after the war. Um, they had runners, guys who, you know, literally ran and carried messages and guys who rode motorcycles um, also to carry messages. But you can imagine that on both sides, it was a, a big objective to kill those men. And so pigeons were one of the best ways to communicate. And they, you know, both the Germans and the Americans, the British, the French, the Belgians, everybody was using pigeons um, because they were so effective. And one of the things that blew my mind in my research is that um, the priority on trying to stop the enemy's pigeons led to some extreme measures where both sides had snipers specifically trained for the purpose of trying to shoot the other side's pigeons out of the sky. And the Germans had falconers, right? Guys who had the, you know, the birds of prey on their arm where the falcons were trained specifically to get the pigeons from the other side to get them out of the sky because the messages that they carried were so important. So, um, you know, like I said, Whittlesey and his men had been captured for four days. They'd been sending pigeons because you would always have a few pigeon officers who would carry the pigeons in a big wicker basket typically. And, you know, Witt had been sending these messages that said, you know, here's where we are. We need food, we need water. And so they were down one pigeon and that pigeon was Cher Ami. And so she carried this note during the friendly fire incident that said, as you can see here, we are along the road parallel to 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. And she did it. Um, she did this remarkable thing where she flew 25 miles in 25 minutes. And I think, you know, when we see Urban pigeons, we don't always appreciate how fast they are. Um, even urban pigeons are pretty fast, but when you've got a specific um, homing or racing pigeon, they are incredibly fast. And so thanks to her, um, the friendly fire incident was stopped and 194 men were saved. And you might be thinking, I thought you said 554 men went in and they did, but that's a testament to just how horrible this ordeal was, um, that only 194 people made it out alive, um, but none of them would have made it out if not for Whittlesey and Cherami, which is why I knew I had to write about them. And so um, Cherami, who's here with one of the medals that she received was very badly injured. She was shot through her eye um, and through her chest. And then as you could see in the first slide, she um, lost her leg. It got shot off too, and it was only hanging by a tendon, but they couldn't reattach it. And so once she had recovered, they made her a tiny wooden leg, um, which is just one of those details that you feel like if you made it up, it would be like too much, but they really did, it's true. Um, and so I just wanna point out too, that that's rare because both sides used so many pigeons and pigeons were almost just accepted. You know, they used horses, they used donkeys, they used dogs. Um, so many of these animals were just considered part of the casualties of war. So it's very rare <laughs> that they would have saved a bird like this, but that speaks to the importance of what she did. 
And so she received the Croix de Guerre with a palm oak leaf cluster. And that's because the French are, um, and have always kind of been more willing to give animals decorations. Um, the American army still isn't as inclined to do that, but General Pershing um, had an unofficial medal made for her and saw her back off to the United States. And so she and Whittlesey, who you can see again pictured here receiving one of his many medals, became incredibly famous for their bravery and what they did. And, you know, Witt, for his incredible tenacity and not surrendering, received the Medal of Honor, the Croix de Guerre, and the Legion of Honor, among many others. And he became known falsely as, you know, as you might have heard when I, when I read, um, Charles Go to Hell Whittlesey, because he was being covered so much in the papers by people like Damon Runyon and all these like newspaper men from Manhattan. Um, one of his commanding officers was asked, well, what do you think Charles Whittlesey said when, when the Germans asked if he would surrender? Um, and this guy is reported to have said, well, I'm sure he told them to go to hell. And that, you know, became kind of this legend. They printed it. And so they said that, you know, he was Charles go to hell Whittlesey when in reality, he, he gave no reply. He just kept, the surrender request from the Germans told everybody they weren't going to surrender and that was it. And so I mention all this because he's kind of an unlikely hero to sort of use a cliche in the sense that he was this extremely sensitive, extremely gentle, very bookish, pretty solitary, introspective man. And nobody expected him to be the kind of hero that he was. And when he got back, it really pained him to be painted as this belligerent, cursing, warlike, macho man. He just, he really didn't like that, but he kind of had no choice. And, you know, as you can see here, he felt a great deal of what we would today call survivor's guilt or PTSD. Because even though he saved so many of his men, he felt awful that he couldn't save more of them. And so he almost always said yes to every request, um, Red Cross fund drives, American Legion fund drives. They even made a movie, a silent movie, because it was the silent era um, in 1919 called The Lost Battalion, and he's in it. They got as many of the survivors of The Lost Battalion to star in this movie. Uh, Cher Ami is in it, and I think, you know, it was 100 years ago and we have a different understanding of trauma, but it's wild to me that they would have taken these incredibly PTSD men and animals and then made them reenact in front of the camera that trauma, but they did. Cher Ami, um, like I said, they fixed her up as best as they could, but you know, when you're that small of an animal and you've been that hurt, you, you probably don't recover. So she died of her wounds uh, much delayed, but still because of them in June of 1919 in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And you can see her here. She's there in uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, which until the 50s was the Army's kind of big East Coast base where they trained pigeons because they went on to use pigeons um, through World War II as well. And, you know, she obviously because of her injuries wasn't able to fly anymore and she was a hero, so they weren't going to send her back to war. Um, but she was kind of a mascot. They toured her around to school children. They toured her around to injured soldiers, kind of saying, like, if this pigeon can recover, so can you. And so she kind of got co-opted as this figure. Um, and part of what probably caused her death is just being trotted out in front of people and literally handed around um, as this kind of mascot. And then this is a spoiler alert. So if you don't want to know what happened to Charles Whittlesey, avert your eyes. But I mean, that's the thing about historical fiction is um, you kind of know how the story ends. And so this is a huge parade after um, the Lost Battalion and everybody came back from overseas. This is through Manhattan. And you can see just like the sea of men who are marching. Everyone's so happy the war is over. Um, and Whittlesey, again, is just this huge hero. And he hated it. He hated being known as a hero. He felt very guilty. He didn't like having to give these speeches. A lot of times he would give these speeches where he would call for peace and he would, you know, say things like, 
we don't have animosity toward the Germans. And if an American soldier met the Kaiser on the road, he would give him a cigarette. Um, you know, we should forgive and forget. And people didn't want to hear it. Uh, you know, on either side of the ocean, there was still this idea that Germany needed to be punished and be made to pay. And that, you know, all these men didn't die for no reason. And we couldn't just forgive and forget. And you know, those of you who are also historians know that, of course, this is a huge part of what laid the groundwork for World War II is just the punishing terms, um, the crushing blows that were dealt to Germany in the wake of World War I. And Whittlesey was very against that because he could tell that that was gonna be a problem, but people didn't wanna listen. So three years after he became a hero, he booked a ticket on this Havana bound United fruit ship, um, because back in the day, they had these big ships that would be partly for industry. So it would carry, um, you know, bananas and other tropical fruits up from the Caribbean. And it would also take passengers down as part of the tourism industry. And so he booked a ticket to Havana, even though he had no business in Havana. And he had just participated in the internment ceremony for the unknown soldier at Arlington. And most people think that that's kind of like the last straw, that that obligation was the one that just broke the camel's back. And so um, he booked this ticket to commit suicide. He specifically wanted to jump into the Atlantic Ocean and that's what he did. And I think as a fiction writer, I have to love my characters and I love Jeremy and Wit so much. And I think this speaks to one of the things I love about Wit is that he was so courteous and so thoughtful. He didn't want to commit suicide in a way that would leave a mess for anybody to clean up. He didn't want to you know, be found or be an inconvenience. And so that's why he chose to jump into the ocean. And in his um, one page will that he left back in his law office, he left the German surrender letter to his co-commander George McMurtry. And so his body was never found and there's just an uh, in memory only in the um, Whittlesey family plot in um, Massachusetts. But Cherami, as I've mentioned, was taxidermied. And then here's where these last two little things that really clinched that I had to write this novel. Um, they taxidermied her and this is my own picture from my pilgrimage to go see her back in 2014. Um, and for her whole life, they'd thought she was a male bird. And if you study French, you even know, cher ami, right? It's the Romance language. So every bit of it is gendered. Um, and cher ami is the name you would give to a male pigeon. But she was a female. And so when they went to stuff her, they discovered this. And I don't think there was any kind of conspiracy. I don't think they were trying to lie when she was alive. I think it's just hard to tell with pigeons. Unless you're actually seen laying an egg, it can be hard to tell if you're female or male. And also in the pigeon world, there's this phenomenon of henny cocks and cocky hens where you'll have a bird whose sex is one thing, but they act like a member of the other gender. And so Cher Ami seems to have been a cocky hen. And so they discovered this, but then they just were like, ah, we'll just leave it. We don't need to change it. Cher Ami is a he. And so I, I think that oversight was what made me think about ideas of um, heroism and gender and how certainly back then, and even to an extent now, there's this idea that heroism is a more manly quality. And that was certainly the case for humans. Um, one of the things that, you know, this is not an original observation to me, um, but one of the things that struck me about World War I, as you can see in this propaganda, slash recruitment poster is there was a fear that American and European manhood was going soft at the time before the war that all these you know kind of red-blooded men who previously would have worked in the fields or would have worked in a factory or done some kind of very manly blue-collar labor were now shifting um, with the urbanization of the population to office jobs you know like I said Whittlesey was a lawyer um, they might have been, you know, businessmen or just some other pursuit that would have had them indoors all day, working in an office, dressing up. And so you can see this poster kind of playing into this where it says enlist and you've got this huge American flag and this big window pane and sort of on the inside of the window is this effete um, sort of white collared gentleman, right? He's in these fancy clothes. He looks kind of thin. 
maybe not so tough. Um, whereas outside the window in the bright sunshine and their military uniforms are all these like strapping men who are ready to fight um, to show Europe how it's done. And so that was really interesting to me because as I was doing my research, I'm almost 100% sure that Charles Whittlesey was a closeted gay man. He didn't you know, keep a journal, so he never literally wrote, I am gay. Um, but the papers after he disappeared called him a confirmed bachelor, emphasized that no woman was involved. But the biggest sort of proof that I have, because people always ask, is um, in, he left nine farewell letters, AKA suicide notes, um, to different people in his life who he wanted to say goodbye to. And the one to John Baird Prynne, who was his former law partner and best friend said, just a note to say goodbye. I'm a misfit by nature and by training and there's an end of it. And so to say that, to call yourself a misfit was a way at that time um, in the early 1920s of basically saying you were gay. And so I thought that that was kind of an opportunity for me to talk about both Cherami and Charles Whittlesey as these unlikely heroes who had this kind of gender sexuality component that I hadn't seen any other writers so far talk about. And I'm, I'm wrapping up with my slides, so get your questions ready if you've got them. Um, but as an undergraduate at Williams College, and this is Witt here as an undergrad, this is from his yearbook, he wrote in his yearbook that the purpose of a college education is learning to judge correctly, to think clearly, and to see and to know the truth, and to attain the faculty of pure delight in the beautiful. And I think that's really beautiful. And I think, um, you know, like I said, I teach at DePaul, I teach undergrads, you know, I, I teach people who are wit's age at the time this photograph was taken, right? He's probably 19, 20, 21. He's so young, right? He's an adult, but like barely, and he has his whole life ahead of him. And so I just find it so moving to think of him and all the people um, at all the eras who, who have given their lives in different ways to this kind of conflict. And so as it says here, I think that's sort of where part of my fascination and my sorrow with World War I lies is that all these beautiful humans and animals got killed and for what nobody knows. I mean, I think with World War I especially, it maybe shows up as a question on a high school history quiz and that's kind of it. And even experts don't fully know why it was fought or what the point was. Um, I think, you know, other wars like World War II, there's these obvious things where it's like, well, of course we have to end the Holocaust. We have to stop the Nazis. Um, but World War I isn't like that. It's just kind of a mess. And so I hope um, that my book kind of gives people a hundred years after the war ended this chance to go back and reconsider it and maybe to think about things that they don't know or stories about it that haven't fully been told. And so that's, that's my novel. So I think uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, and so hopefully, yeah, I think that worked. It looks like it worked. So um, yeah, so now for Q&A. Okay. Well, that was wonderful and very sad. Um, Thank you. But beautifully said when you're telling of it. Um, we do have some questions, but I want to provide a comment first because it's a lovely comment. So uh, Agatha Gallo, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Hi, Kathleen. Thank you so much. I don't know if you read my chat comment, but for our book club, which I have a, I'm in a small book club of about seven people, we chose the book, Lillian Box uh, Fish Takes a Walk. And it was um, suggested by somebody because of the style of the book, which sounds a lot like what you just talked about, except that, you know, it's all from Lillian Box Fish's walk down in New York. And, and it was so beautifully written, I must tell you. I think it was your first book, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it's um, not, it's my first novel that got famous. <laughs> oh, got <laughs> it. Okay. All right. Well, anyway. Enjoy, Agatha. Go out and get uh, the rest of them. Yeah. And uh, yes, 
But anyways, I'm really looking forward to reading this book. Uh, it's, Thank you, Agatha. It's pretty, it's pretty timely because of World War One and and how many years it's been since, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the ending or the beginning, so I'm sorry about what 2020 or 2019. But anyways, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks, Love Agatha. So um, if you could just briefly, she mentioned that the book that she read is also based on uh, someone that was real. Can you huh. give us a brief description yeah yeah of, of course so yeah so Lillian Boxfish takes a walk um which did as Agatha says in the chat came out in um 2017 is very similar to this book in that it's based on I, I changed the name of the person it was based on this woman Margaret Fishback who was in the 30s the highest paid female advertising copywriter in America and she was the head of divisional copywriting for Macy's so she that was a know, lot. in New York yeah and she was um, kind of, I, I guess I would say, you know, a pattern in my writing, at least when I'm doing historical material, which I don't always do, but when I do, I try to find characters who kind of were so famous in their day, but who in the passing of time have become more obscure. Mm -hmm. And I try to hold them up now because I think people like Margaret and people like Wit and people like Jeremy have a lot to teach us, even though, you know, they've been dead a long time. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We do have a couple questions and Miss Joan Green, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Well, hi, Kathleen. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you about the mental health aspects, which you've dealt with a little bit now since I asked my question. But my great uncle John came back from World War II and he had been, quote, shell-shocked, which is what they called it in those days. And as a result, instead of have, being able to live a, a normal life and a productive life, he spent his whole life in a VA hospital. And I'm uh, wondering if you want to talk a little bit about some of the aspects of the mental health well, we yeah. talked about the suicide, certainly, of, uh, you know, in the book, but talk more about the mental health results of the war. Yeah, yeah, Joan, that's, thanks for sharing and sharing that about your uncle. And, you know, I don't have numbers, partly because I don't have them, and also partly because they didn't really keep statistics mm -hmm. on how many people got PTSD or shell shock, because it was obviously known as a phenomenon, but it was extremely stigmatized, extremely, um, it just wasn't commonly talked about and it was very poorly understood. And I would say that today we're making improvements in that front, but as far as it goes, we're still learning a lot. And so, yeah, a lot of, that's one of the things like later on in the book, like after Wit and um, Jeremy have both come back, I do kind of depict some of that, how, you know, what's the Kind of wild thing about war is you don't know how it's going to affect you right. until you go through it and so you would see this where some of the guys would seem fine um you know mcmurtry who i mentioned went on to live just a normal life as a wall street investor and he was kind of this pillar of strength for the other guys like he held every year a thanksgiving dinner for all the veterans of the lost battalion who wanted to participate he spent his own money on it he invited everybody um, kind of made it this safe space for them to come together and not have to explain themselves to others. Whereas there's this other guy who I talk about in the book, um, Private Munson, who was real and he was in that movie, The Lost Battalion, you can see him um, in the movie, uh, but he kind of lost his mind like so many men did where he spiraled into alcoholism. Um, he eventually became homeless and died a pauper and his family actually had to come to Whittlesey and ask for money to pay for his funeral. So I don't have numbers, but it was a huge, right huge problem. And so I think, you know, I hope this book talks about it. And then this isn't your question, and I want to get to the other questions, but just another thing this talks about is sort of, um, aside from the psychic injuries, which were considerable, the physical injuries were so horrific. And, you know, there were towns had ugly laws where, you know, they existed before against like beggars and disabled people, but the men would come back. And if they had 
you know, a facial wound or lost an eye or lost a nose, you know, plastic surgery wasn't that good. So they were required um, in many cities to wear masks or to not come out in the daytime because they would scare women and children. So it was not, um, you know, the country was not very evolved at that time on providing support for the men who came back. Well, and it was several conflicts and wars. I mean, all the way up until the late nineties before these men and women came back and were actually treated with compassion. And I think we probably all have people in our family who are suffering visible and invisible scars from their past times. So it's, 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 uh, it, it just sad to know it's gone back, you know, and we can, I'm sure the civil war, there's so many stories that could be told. All right, I have a bit of trivia from an anonymous attendee, a shy attendee who doesn't want to uh, give their name, but they, um, they're they saying, uh, they love that the story's in first person pigeon and that we are hearing seeing this program just after the announcement that a female racing pigeon just sold for $1.9 million. That yes. is, so, so pigeons are at least getting, um, they're not all flying rats. Some of them are treated very well. Yeah, yeah, well, and, that, and thank you, Anonymous, and I, I love that, too. Everybody, I love that now my, you know, friends and, like, Twitter followers know that, like, all pigeon news has to be shared with me, and so everybody <laughs> shared that story, and yeah, this pigeon, you should all look her up if you haven't seen the story. She's um, really beautiful. Uh, her name is New Kim, and um, an anonymous Chinese buyer bought her. We think it's, it's a, a world clouded in competition um, but he, it's the same person who previously bought last year, this pigeon named Armando, wow. who's kind of like the best male racing pigeon. So the plan seems to be that they're probably going to mate them. Uh -huh. And that's one, you know, I, I won't go on and on, but I, I got so far into pigeon um, facts. I'm kind of a crazy pigeon lady now. And one of the things I love about pigeons is that um, they do mate for life. If, you know, one pigeon dies, they will remarry. Um, but they are very devoted to each other. And I'm, you can see this is my kitchen. Um, I live in the third floor. Um, my husband and I have a condo. And so while I was writing this book, two pigeons moved in under the eaves, like no. right out there. And we got to see them raise their babies. And, and one pigeon fact, if you'll indulge me, is that um, the pigeons are very egalitarian parents. Like the mom and the dad both sit on the egg. And when the baby it's usually two eggs. When the two babies hatch, the mom and the dad both feed them um, with pigeon milk. And of course, they're not mammals. It's not milk, really. But they have this substance that they make in their throat, their crops, and they both take turns feeding the babies, wow. which I just, I'm like, I don't know. Humans could take notes. I don't know. Human dads. 21st century parenting we've got going yeah. on. All yeah. right. We have a question from Carol Conboy. Carol, I've asked you to unmute. Thank you, Kathleen. I love this book. I want to go out and get a copy of it. So thank you so much. But I just had a question about yeah. pigeons and the preface that we had a, a good friend, a woman who was the pigeon lady, bird lady. She used to be at one of the beaches and she always would sit on the bench and feed the pigeons. And she did it in her home, up in her backyard. But lots of neighbors were on her for that. They didn't yeah. like the pigeons, considering them rats, kind of thing. Yeah. But I just wondered, had you talk about the training of pigeons at all in the book? Yes, great okay. question. I I do. I talk a lot about it, and that's one of the things that you, in the Sherami plotline, um, you know, I go into the true facts of her life. She was a British pigeon, so she grew up on this farm. Mm. And what happened was um, she was previously a racing pigeon. She wasn't originally intended to be a war bird, but pigeon racing was and still is very popular. Um, and so one of the farmers who raised her, raised her to be like a very fast bird. And she had won a lot of purses, a lot of prizes. And so then the British government put this call out that said, you know, the Americans are coming, they're gonna need pigeons. So we need your best pigeons. And so they donated Cher Ami. Um, and part of the reason they think they donated Sharon Mead to the war effort, because it's like, why give one of your best birds to, to the war where she'll probably get killed? And they think it was that gender thing where she was not laying eggs and she was acting like a, 
um, they thought she was a, a male and, you know, since she was neither laying eggs nor mating with the other birds in a way that was productive. So they think that it was partly like, well, she's won a bunch of prizes, but she's not going to have any kids. So we can send her. Um, but then there's like tons of training scenes. It's almost like Rocky for pigeons. You know, you see her like taking shorter flights and longer flights and just like all the stuff. Um, and again, I'll, I won't ramble too much, but just the science of how birds, you know, the pigeons do this is still not fully understood. Like they can find their way home from like hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And they think it's a combination of sight and smell mm -hmm. um, and sound and just maybe even like little magnets in their beaks. And so, yes, if you, if you are craving pigeon training information, it's in there. That's awesome. Carolyn Brown, I have asked you to unmute. Hi. Boy, that was so interesting. And thank you, Kathleen. I taught US history for 22 years and it got to the point in the curriculum where they said, we don't care exactly what you teach as long as you get through Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so in my analysis, I had to choose between an in-depth study of the Revolutionary War or an in-depth study of World War I. And I chose the Revolutionary War, but after listening to you, I really, I'm like, boy, did I do my students a disservice? I'm wondering. I mean, you must have really delved into that war to write this book. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, well, that's such a tough call. I'm reading right now um, Jill Lepore's These Truths, which is that big one volume history of the United States. And I am in the Revolutionary War part now. And so I'm, I'm really interested in the Revolutionary War too. But I think in a way, um, I, I mean, of course, I'm going to say I like World War One, partly too, because it's sort of the birth of the modern world. And so I don't know, it's not that we can't relate to stuff from farther in the past. I love all history. But I think there's something about World War One that students might find appealing because it really was this pivot point where the 19th century and really everything that came before hinged and opened into whatever this is that we're living now. And again, I won't go on and on. But but even these ideas of colonialism, like my dad, again, he's he's a vet and he he wrote this, he shared with me this amazing paper he wrote for his own class on the machine gun. And this is just one little tidbit that speaks to my answer. He said that one of the things about the machine gun that's so typical of World War I is that they had been using the machine gun a little bit like the British on their colonial subjects, like in the Boer War in this horrible, you know, racist, white supremacist kind of way. But then when they applied it to World War I, a lot of the people were like, well, won't the machine gun hurt our guys too? Like the Germans have it now and won't, won't British people be getting killed by the machine gun? And the British officers in 1914, they changed their mind by 1918, but in 1914, they literally thought that like the, the racial and colonial superiority of the British soldiers and their training and their valor would somehow keep them from falling victim to the machine gun. And that's why you saw these crazy charges of these men getting mowed down. Um, and it took them forever to realize. So I think, I don't know, there's something about World War I that's like, it speaks to the craziness of whatever whatever we're still doing in 2020. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, it was like the advent of globalism and technology. It was like the crossroads of so many different things. Yeah. It's the timing of it. And then even the pandemic, which came yeah. right afterwards, there's just a lot of things happening at that Yeah, time. and then the roaring 20s, everybody wants to just have fun because World War One was so horrible. They just want to move on. So and yeah. Carolyn, I'm sorry you only could teach one you had to pick yeah. those. I mean, that just makes me, it just makes me sad for, because I'm sure you're such a great teacher and the kids yeah. are out on learning um, something else. Trudy Doyle, I am asking you to unmute. So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It, it um, was very touching to me because my dad was in World War I and we heard so many of his um, stories, uh, not so many, but <laughs> stories that he chose to share with us. And um, so four years ago, my husband and I went to France and went to 
have um, a lengthy all day private tour of the um, Bellow Woods, which my dad talked about so much. And, and it really um, brought so much alive. The story sounds like it's um, going to just enrich um, my pursuit of knowledge about World War I and I can't wait to um, read it. I also loved Lillian Boxfish. I would have loved to have gone for a walk with her. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, that's beautiful. I'm so glad you got to go. I haven't gotten to go to any of the battlefields but I hope to, you know, when the pandemic is over, I wanna go see where this happened. I think it's, yeah, it's important to see. All right, I think we have one more person, Meg Herman. If you could unmute. Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you for this wonderful program. And I didn't have a question. I must have just made a boo-boo, but it, oh. uh, it's, <laughs> it, it was a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, and thank you for sharing it. Thanks, Meg. Thank you. I see, uh, I see in the chat two, two more I, questions. I see, it, just, I, see yeah. I see them, yep. Um, let's do Nan first. Oh. Nan, unmute yourself. You got a great question. Hi. Hello. Great presentation. And I love your colors that you, your natural and your red. Thank you. <laughs> In your research, how do the pigeons know where to go? They're homing pigeons, so they come back. Yeah. But about 25 miles? Yeah, so great question. And so, yeah, what happens with homing pigeons is that anywhere that they're trained to consider their roost or their loft, their home, they'll come back to. And so that can change. I mean, you know, obviously pigeon communication is just one way. You release them from a point and they come home. That's their like secret power. And so what um, you know, I depict the Americans as doing is they get all these birds from all over the place. And then that's a big training thing is they have to, you know, because they're going to be used, they're going to send the pigeons to the front, right? So all these guys, when they go on their charges, go to the trenches, have baskets full of pigeons at the front. And so in the rear, that's where they've been trained to consider their home. And so that's why anytime the pigeons got released from the front, they would always come back. And so that's not just applicable to the war. You could do that with your house and your friend's house. You could like train a bunch of pigeons and be like, go to Nan's house. Um, if they considered it home, that's where they'd go. And then within that, I think some of the other things are pretty ingenious. They would paint them to look a certain way because of the visual, the visual aspect, like the lofts would have colors and sometimes even little targets or like landing pads. And then they also train the birds to land on a perch where they would ring a bell. Um, and this is something that comes from the world of racing is that the pigeons alight on the landing pad and it gets recorded so you can tell who won and they ring a bell to be like, hey, I'm back. And so share on me and this is what's so touching is even as she was all messed up from the flight, she made it home and she, before she just like passed out from her wounds, she dinged the bell. And so that tenacity is something that just moved me incredibly about these animals. Wow, that tears, tears. Um, <laughs> So the last question um, I was given permission to ask on her behalf, do you, are you working on anything right now? I am. I, um, so DePaul's last day is today for the fall quarter. And so my big plan for December is um, to try to finish a manuscript that I'm working on. Uh, my agent doesn't know anything about it yet. So I don't okay. know if it's going to go anywhere, <laughs> but it's about um, a silent movie star from Chicago. So it's going to be kind of a Chicago, kind of a Hollywood book. So stay tuned. Oh, that's great. So kind of the same time frame. Yeah. Same yeah. Time. I, for whatever reason, I'm just obsessed with the 19 teens and twenties. I think they were just so fascinating. So um, hopefully my agent will like it and you'll get to read it in a couple of years. Awesome. We, we do too. Um, well, it sounds like you've got some new fans after today. And, yes. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add before we sign off? 
Yeah, no, I think um, just, you know, I'm so grateful to everybody. Thanks for spending part of your afternoon with me. I think, you know, stuff like this is definitely getting me through a weird time. And so it's it's just been an honor. So, you know, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, all the question askers. And hopefully, you know, see you maybe in person next time I have a book out. Oh, that would be great. Well, like Deb said, you can pick up a copy of Kathleen's current book or any of her past books if you now want to kind of go back in her bibliography either at the book table or um, bookshop.org is another great place to find books um, we have programs every monday afternoon and if you want to find out what we're doing for the next couple of weeks go to our website www.19thcentury.org if you want to help us keep putting on these wonderful programs and you want to make a donation you can also go right to our homepage at www.19thcentury.org for the whole organization, the 19th Century Charitable Association, it's Erin Payton, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.